Hey everyone, it is our compilation video um, about DHEA. That's what we've been talking about this week. Um, so I've put up kind of the story collection over on Instagram, so you can go check that out if you want and um, give those a view. But we're gonna cover everything in this compilation video too. So as a reminder, or as a reminder, excuse me, please um, like and subscribe to uh, this video and to my channel if you like what, what I'm doing and providing the education I'm doing. I don't monetize this. I don't get anything from it, but there's so much medical misinformation out there. I just really want people to have the education and the knowledge to be able to help kind of facilitate their own um, health. Otherwise, um, our three languages we looked at this week um, were uh, Serbian, Icelandic, and Swahili. So if you guessed any of those, uh, good for you. But let's get talking about DHEA. So remember, DHEA stands for dehydroepiandosterone. Um, it is a hormone that is produced uh, predominantly in the adrenal glands. Around 90% of DHEA is produced in the adrenal glands. The remaining 10% is a mixture of kind of uh, produced in the gonads and also in the brain. DHEA has a very important subset or subtype called DHEAS um, that is almost 100% exclusively produced in the adrenal glands and has a lot different binding affinity um, for certain hormonal receptors. Now, DHEA will pass through the blood-brain barrier, which is kind of a protective mechanism around the brain to keep certain hormones out, um, whereas DHEAS will not. And for this reason, some of the things, um, if you look um, at kind of potential uh, uses for DHEA in terms of medication or hormonal treatment, really affect uh, brain functions, especially what's called a neurotropic effect, which is uh, something that would cause nerves to kind of regrow and help with some cognitive related issues um, in the brain. Now, DHEA and DHES are both considered pro-hormones, meaning that by themselves, they're not really that hormonally active, but they break down into very um, specific um, and very active hormones. In these cases, um, we're talking about estrogens and androgens. Remember, estrogens are estrone, estradiol, estriol, estetrol. Androgens are basically um, testosterone and then dihydrotestosterone or DHT. Um, they break down into that uh, via what's called an intracrine pathway, meaning that the tissue is going to take kind of what it needs from that DHEA and kind of fill that. And for this reason, it's not often a good idea um, if you're looking for specific hormonal corrections to take DHEA as like a pill or like if you were to put it in a cream or a shot of it or things like that because you cannot predict what it's going to break down into. And so if you say, well, I have low testosterone symptoms, I'm going to take some DHEA, well, you may get a whole bunch of, you know, estrogens as opposed to the androgens there. So that's just a little caveat. Um, now, um, vaginal DHEA is a little bit different, and we'll talk about that here in just a bit. Symptoms, or what DHEA really is used for, especially when we're talking about hormonal effects, is it's what's called an adren... Uh, or, um, it goes with um, adrenarche, or the development of axillary and pubic hair. Um, and so patients who have low DHEAs, especially as children, if there's some sort of kind of adrenal disease where it's not producing the DHEA or a brain tumor or things like that, they may not have normal um, underarm and uh, you know body and pubic hair growth. So that's something to kind of consider when you're looking at this from more of a pediatric standpoint. Now, um, DHEA, like I said, since it breaks down into those estrogens and the androgens there, a lot of times we'll see it elevated in symptoms, or excuse me, in conditions where you have um, abnormal uh, testosterone or estrogen-related symptoms. The most common thing we would see in the United States, at least, is a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. I've talked about that in the past. You can check out that video um, if you want to look more into that. But a lot of times patients who have DA or who have PCOS will have elevated DHEAs, especially DHEA sulfates or DHEASs. And typically this will manifest with things like increased uh, facial hair, body hair, oily skin, acne. Um, and DHEA, especially if it's, if it's really elevated, you can also show signs of virilization. And that would be things like deepening of the voice, really substantial male pattern hair loss, um, you know, uh, enlargement of the clitoris, those things that kind of take that just elevated testosterone to the next step. 
Now, when you're looking at DHEA, the most important thing to remember is that this is a hormone of adrenal functioning. It is a measurement, really, of how good your adrenal glands are, you know, kicking around. And so if there is something that is causing adrenal overactivity, you will often see elevated levels of DHEA. And likewise, if there's something that's, you know, causing adrenal um, inactivity or decreased adrenal function, that DHEA will be lower. And so, you know, I've sometimes had patients come in and say, oh, well, they drew a DHEA, so I, I know that I'm testosterone deficient. Well, that's not really the case. DHEA is, remember, like I said, a measurement of adrenal function. So that's really what you're looking at. So what are some conditions that can cause that? Well, we talked a little bit about, you know, PCOS causing elevated DHEA levels and DHEAS. Um, obviously, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, especially adult onset, CIH can be associated with elevations in those levels too, um, as can Cushing's disease. Um, Cushing's disease is a condition where basically there is um, kind of overproduction of a normal adrenal hormones, especially the what are called mineralocorticoids um, and uh, glucocorticoids too. Um, and um, that can cause high levels of DHEA. And so patients with Cushing's disease may often, or uh, Cushing's syndrome, excuse me, may present with, um, you know, the kind of increased facial hair and those types of, of high testosterone symptoms as well. Um, now, I will also say that brain tumors can both affect uh, or can affect the adrenal glands in either an um, uh, hyperactivity or uh, underactivity or hypoactivity, um, depending on the type. And this is going to lead to, you know, kind of uh, relative changes in those DHEA levels. So if you have someone that comes in with a new onset of a headache, visual changes, they're having some hormonal things like, oh man, my period's not coming, you know, I haven't had a period in six months, but I'm, you know, having all this kind of excess of facial hair, or things like that, what's going on? You also want to make sure you're looking at those, um, you know, some of those brain hormones um, that are being produced in the pituitary gland that are causing stimulation on either the adrenal glands or the, you know, gonads themselves. Remember that sex hormones are really most hormones in the body, um, especially kind of in the in the abdomen um, and pelvis are kind of go through this what's called H, P, and then either G in terms of gonads, A, which is adrenal, um, you know, access. So H is hypothalamus, P is pituitary, and then you've got the end organ. So the hypothalamus sends hormones to the pituitary gland, which then sends hormones to the target organ, and then they all have these things called negative feedbacks, which basically once that hormone gets to a certain level, it shuts off the production of the stimulating hormone from the gland above it. So um, anyway, we can talk about that in the future if anyone wants. Put a comment below if you want me to delve into that more. But um, for conditions that cause low DHEA levels, um, the most common thing we would see is Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency. In the United States, uh, John F. Kennedy was famous for having Addison's disease. Um, um, and basically that's a condition where the adrenal gland doesn't work really well. And so you would have low um, DHEA levels as a manifestation of that. Obviously things that cause, um, you know, tumors that can cause that um, underactivity can cause that too. Also patients that have had a stroke um, or a brain infarct where blood does not get to the pituitary once again may have kind of more of that underactivity too as those stimulating hormones coming out of the brain are not being released because it's not producing them. So things to kind of think about. Um, you know, obviously um, this is all good and great, but a lot of times people want to know, well, okay, what can I do if I have these things? If my DHEA is low, can I take a medication or a supplement? What can I, you know, whatever it may be. In the U.S., there is currently one FDA-approved formulation of DHEA, um, in the gynecology world at least, and that's a medication called Intrarosa. Intrarosa, like I've said, is one of my favorite medications out there. It's a vaginal preparation of prasterone, which is the name of, kind of the trade name of the DHEA. It's around 10 milligrams or so. Um, and um, basically with that, what it does is it's in a little kind of palm oil um, suppository and that's inserted into the vagina every night. Now, Intrarosa is um, FDA approved for the treatment of painful intercourse as a um, basically a symptom of genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM. We spoke about that, I think last week, honestly, but here recently. Um, and what it does is not only as that breaks down through that intracrine process, it goes into estrogens um, and uh, the androgens. Now, unlike 
taking a pill orally, um, the enterosa does not have a systemic spread per se. So this is something that we find very useful in patients who are not wanting systemic hormone therapy, but are still having these symptoms. So obviously GSM patients, nursing mothers, um, patients that are on birth control or, you know, that have a hormonal vestibulitis, really all of these things that the enterosa could be helping um, vaginally at least, or vestibularly at least, is this kind of overarching vestibulodynia or vestibulitis due to low hormone levels. And that's a low estrogen and a low androgen, low testosterone specifically, because the vestibule of the vagina is very, very rich in androgen receptors. And so remember, if those receptors are not getting filled, the tissue gets angry and irritable, and you can throw all the estrogen you want at it, and they still will have pain and discomfort. And a lot of these patients will show up with signs of things like chronic urinary tract infections or chronic, you know, yeast infections. And no one has ever been able to demonstrate that they have yeast or they have, you know, a urinary tract infection. But they're like, oh my gosh, it itches, it burns, there's something going on. Well, it's a hormonal effect, folks. And especially in non-menopausal patients, the most two or the two most common kind of causes are oral contraceptive pills and nursing, um, being postpartum, not being a nurse. Um, but you could be a nurse who's nursing on birth control pills and then you'd have a lot of issues. Um, but you know, with that, you can use enterosa or you can use vaginal DHEA to, um, you know, to, to, to fix those types of symptoms. Now there is some research that's being done that's looking at kind of vaginal preparations causing some systemic effects, namely increase in sex drive. Um, you know, and that's something that it can be, we see sometimes used in Europe. Um, you know, testosterone has a, a consensus agreement on its use for the treatment of low sex drive in both premenopausal and postmenopausal women. So if you're getting a breakdown into testosterone, you could in theory say, yes, that's what's probably causing it. Once again, there's not enough data yet for me to make an official kind of, you know, opinion about that, but that would be the hypothesized way that's, that's treating. Now I do get patients that ask, well, can I take DHEA for X, Y, and Z, whether it's, you know, hot flashes, night sweats, lichen sclerosis, whatever it may be. Um, if you're using it vaginally, um, you're not going to get a whole lot of benefits, most likely, for the vasomotor symptoms associated with menopause, like the hot flashes and the night sweats. Now for lichen sclerosis, remember that the big thing that we're worried about with LS is, is it going to turn into, you know, squamous cell carcinoma? And as it stands right now, the, you know, DHEA has not been shown to reduce that chance. Will it help with some of the other symptoms? Most likely. So this is a, re this is a really good adjuvant therapy to the clobetazole or betamethasone or kind of however like ultra potent steroid that you know you're using. So I'll have a lot of patients that I'm you know giving some form of hormonal support to their vulva um, as we're treating their LS just because it helps things heal quicker. Um, so that's that's great yeah no problem there but is it a primary treatment? No we would not use it for that. Now, systemic DHEA, like I said, if you were to go and take a pill or, you know, you see these things at health food stores or you, know, you can you probably even see it like at Walmart or, you know, Walgreens or your uh, pharmacy. Oh, here's your DHEA supplement. This is going to help with X, Y, and Z. Well, the first thing is most supplements are not actually quality checked. Um, so you don't know if you're what you're actually getting. I've kind of said the statement before, but I could make Corey's supplements and they're just a bunch of sawdust and I'll sell them to you for one million dollars. And there's probably going to be someone that's going to buy it, you know, so maybe I should do that. But that's not ethical, so don't do that. Um, but, you know, as far as, um, you know, the actual, like, use of it, you know, from a supplement standpoint, you're bazooka therapying. You don't know what you're going to get. And you can have elevated levels of testosterone that can be problematic. You can get too high of an estradiol. You know, so I, I'm always very cautious about recommending patients taking that. Now, I will say, um, you know, I do get patients that say, hey, they checked my DHEA and it's low. Should I take DHEA? Well, that's a great question because, you know, you first need to figure out why is your DHEA low? That would be my first question to you. Like, what is going on with your adrenal glands that is causing that? And the next question is, 
is that low DHEA actually a manifestation of something else? So things that can cause that to be low, like we talked about Addison's disease, very, very high levels of stress, sleep deprivation may cause a little bit of those changes that causes a release of other adrenal hormones. So you could kind of, you know, think um, that in stressful situations, our reproductive hormone levels are typically decreased because our body doesn't want us to reproduce. And the main function of DHEA, aside from the, you know, neurotropic effect is to affect our gonads. So it's going to be kind of that, you know, reflexive type thing. Autoimmune conditions, you may see a decrease in DHEA, especially if there's any type of autoimmune assault on um, gonadal functioning or adrenal functioning. So, but anyway, I, I am very hesitant to tell people to take supplemental DHEA just because I think, A, you don't know what you're going to get, and B, you're band-aiding the problem. I want to know what the actual root cause of the problem is because I have not read and found someone who only has low DHEA just in isolation. Like it is a symptom of something else. It's just like, you know, who has just low testosterone? Like what's the cause of the low testosterone? Is it age-related changes? Okay, that's something. Is it related to stress? Is it related to dietary stuff? Whatever it may be, you know, you gotta find the root cause. That's, that's how you get better. You know, and that's how you stay healthy, which is even more important. You got to get to the root cause. So anyway, that's what I know for today, folks. As obviously, if you have any questions, let me know. But I will see you next week. And I think we're going to go back to talking about something in terms of sex med then. So if you're still here and you're listening, um, I really appreciate it. Um, share this video with your friends. Otherwise, I'm Corey Babb. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll talk to you then.